I'd like to thank not only Director General Halperin, but also uh, Chief Economist Yair Elat, who who's, uh, has hosted me here, uh, Ori Schwartz, as the Chief Legal Counsel, and of course, Noah Svi, who's made it all work for me. So thank you, thank you all. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm afraid I don't speak Hebrew. I mean, as you can tell, I'm doing this in English. I have to tell you, though, um, hearing that the program's in Hebrew, which I understand, here we are in Israel, um, I was thinking back, so I, I, was, I did studied Hebrew for my bar mitzvah, but it was literally, it, it's difficult for me to say this, but I'm gonna say it 50 years ago. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, can I remember any of my Hebrew? Not just for, not really for my talk at all, because there's no hope, but just even for getting around Israel, since I haven't visited recently. And I have to tell you, uh, as a teacher for all these years, as a professor, you learn that people often remember, students often remember, you need to repeat things for students to remember very often. It's just part of the learning process, okay? Sometimes you take a class a second time and the material sinks in, or you just repeat things, exercises, and I thought back, and um, what did I remember most from my Hebrew school 50 years ago? There's one phrase, I, I remember almost nobody Hebrew, but I do remember what the teacher must have said over and over again, sheket bevakasha. <laughs> so that's my Hebrew, but I don't really think I'm gonna use it with you. Okay, so my, uh, my topic here, is there a clicker? Uh, so antitrust in a time of populism, uh, so this is a very much coming from an American perspective in terms of what we've been seeing in the United States. Uh, I've had the, the opportunity and honor to, to be quite involved, not just during the first term of the Obama, Obama administration in working in the Justice Department and in the White House, but in the second term as well, working closely with the DOJ and the FTC. I've served as an expert witness, consultant to them on a number of major antitrust matters. And what we've seen the last few years leading up to the election, to be sure, was generally a rise of populism. And, and that really, for the first time for many years, actually antitrust came up in the presidential campaign, okay, which was sort of surprising. And I'll talk about some of the things the candidates said. But the context for my talk here is a view in, in, in the United States that's really gotten a lot of traction in recent years, that we have excessive corporate power, that we have inequality, in income and wealth are, have become considerably more pronounced, and this is related to large corporations, and at least now, in the last couple of years, the idea that this may also be related to market power and it, antitrust or other forms of uh, government regulation might have a role to play here. Okay. So what I want to do in my talk is go through some of the things that, that we're hearing that are being said in the political discourse in America and in the press, then look a little bit at the data, really what is going on and what's really behind that. Is it just political rhetoric? Is it reality? And then what the implications are for antitrust and competition policy. And definitely, I confess, I'm speaking mostly about the American context, learning a little bit about, about your antitrust agency and, and some of your issues. I'll try to draw some lessons for Israel, but I won't uh, claim to know enough to do that very well. Okay, so. Uh, all right, so uh, in the press, some of the themes that we've seen, uh, speeches and in a lot of uh, newspapers, magazines, is the notion that we've had corporate consolidation, uh, which is creating more corporate power and high profits. Okay, and obviously that's gonna relate to mergers issues when we come to it, with a, a little foreshadowing of the implications, wh what I see as the relation to your situation, we have had a lot of markets in America which we have generally been quite competitive uh, and less concentrated, obviously a much larger economy. And as, as many of these markets have become more consolidated, we have more markets that are arguably oligopolies or tight oligopolies, a situation you've been living with for a long time in many industries. So however we got there, we're now maybe more in that situation and sharing that with you, for better or worse, than, than used to be the case. Okay. Um, all right, so, uh, so this, is, this is what we're hearing. What are some of the particulars? So um, this is an article a year or so ago from the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal is not exactly a bomb-throwing radical paper, uh, and they're saying a growing number of industries, US, US, are dominated by a shrinking number of companies. And I, I won't go through these particular charts, but they're measuring 
Herfindahl index and, and, and concentration in, in a number of different, you got internet software, airlines, media, and you know, what those are, are those relevant markets? Probably not, but this is the type of thing that we're seeing in the press, okay? Uh, and, and it's not just, you know, it, it, it's across the spectrum. In New York Times editorial from uh, markets work best when there's competition in too many industries, competition just doesn't exist anymore. It's a pretty strong statement. Or with competition in tatters, the rip of inequality widens. So this connection being drawn between competition and, and uh, income and wealth inequality, which, you know, if many of us in the US are concerned about that inequality, I've been concerned about it for a long time, but didn't really think that anti antitrust seemed like pretty remote, but now people are talking about that. What's the connection? Um, here's, uh, there's some nice actually work that by the, the Economist did, did that I'll come back to in a moment, uh, looking at four firm concentration ratios, okay, the share of the top four firms, and, and staying here, stating here, in between a third and two thirds of the market, there's been an increase in concentration as measured that way. From, uh, but, but again, notice, the four from concentration ratios are not, they're not reporting 80% concentration ratios, they're reporting 24 up to 33%. And they have a number of different industries. We'll come back to this. I don't expect you to be able to read it, but they've got the bar that shows 1997 and then 2012. So looking at a 15 year time span. And in many of these industries, um, they're, seeing, they're seeing an increase. Okay, so this type of observation and that has gotten, as an, as not just as an antitrust practitioner, but as a professor in, my, in the corresponding field of economics, industrial organization, it's got the field talking about, are we missing something? Do these sort of increases in concentration, do they represent a problem? Have the antitrust authorities been allowing concentration when they shouldn't have been? These are good questions, and you'll have to wait a few minutes for me to give my answer. Um, here's a few, uh, just a couple of charts to illustrate the type of things that are happening in sectors. I know, uh, you know agriculture is an important sector for you, to be sure. This is showing some of the consolidations in the seed industry, uh, where you know, Monsanto or Bayer or DuPont, Dow, have increasingly acquired seed companies and other firms. And now we have a merger uh, between Bayer and, and Monsanto on the table. Uh, and we have actually the President of the United States meeting with the two CEOs just recently to talk about that. So it was an interesting development, to say the least. So we've had considerable consolidation there. We've had the same thing in the financial sector. Again, it's, it's more the visuals here than any particular names, but here's the companies that have merged into Citicorp, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo over a period of 15 years or so, okay, or 20 years. So, uh, and certainly when we came out of the Great Recession, a much more concentrated financial sector than we used to have. Okay, which is you know, ironic and worrisome to a competition person because if you have too big to fail, it seems like it's gonna be more of a problem when you have a more concentrated sector. Okay. So that's, on, that's what we're hearing in the press and beyond on concentration. Then we've got issues about profit levels. Okay. I mean, The Economist you know, says profits are too high, America needs a giant dose of competition. Okay. And of course it gets economists and I would think others thinking, well, gee, high profits are sort of, are they really that bad? I mean, that means companies are successful. It means they're uh, gonna have incentive to invest. It should draw in entry. Um, but uh, is there a point where it's too high or, too, or, too, or the profits continue for too long? Maybe you saw this, uh, this uh, special issue by The Economist last fall uh, talking about superstar companies, really the some of the big tech companies. And uh, somewhat to my surprise, really, The Economist, which I respect a lot as a magazine, um, was really taking the tack of, we've got some very powerful, overly strong, overly uh, tech companies, you know, whether it's Google or Amazon, um, Apple, that are um, overly powerful, let's say, uh, as opposed to just awesome and successful, <laughs> okay? Um, they look kind of cool in there, but, um, and this is The Economist again. Uh, the rise of the corporate colossus threatens both competition and the legitimacy of business. So that, that's a pretty, those are pretty strong statements, right? Um, uh, there's another strand here, I'll have a couple slides here and then I'll return to this when I look a little more closely at the data, on um, cross ownership, okay? Uh, not the same type of thing I think that your concentration law is focused on, but within an industry, investment funds owning all the companies. The, 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 one of the best examples is the airline industry, 
where um, some of the institutional investors, all the major institutional investors, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity, will own a share of each of the major airlines. So the question becomes, when, the, when some of the largest shareholders in these companies own all the companies in industry, is that a problem? You know, the share ownerships maybe only be five or seven percent, but they're cross ownership. So there's been research in this area, and you know, again, the economists calling it stealth socialism, a contradiction at the heart of financial capitalism, which is to say these uh, large uh, you know, financial entities that serve a very valuable role of diversification, index funds are very popular, but that means they own all the in many industries a significant piece of each of the firms. Is that really healthy for competition? Um, just on the, really on the political side of it, and then I'll, then I'll turn more to the data. Um, so um, Hillary Clinton, you may, may remember her. She was supposed to be the first female president of the United States. It didn't work out for her. Um, so, so she pointed to a report by the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, uh, which I'm going to say a little bit more about in a moment, uh, indicating that uh, concerns about concentration. So she's pointing to that, and that got a lot of visibility. I'll talk about that. And then um, her campaign basically weighing into antitrust issues, as I said, in the presidential campaign, uh, and, and indicating a desire to uh, more commitment to actually antitrust enforcement, um, reigning in uh, economic power, and reinvigorating antitrust laws enforcement. So that's where she, she was talking that way in the campaign. And the Democratic Party was even you know, more uh, that direction, let's say, um, saying the deck is stacked for those at the top. So this notion that you know, things are kind of rigged, the powerful companies have too much power, and one way to deal with that is by uh, stopping more concentration, reining them in in some way. And, and Elizabeth Warren, who, who you know, carries the, the more progressive left-wing side of the party, saying competition in America is dying. And it's very strong language, right? Consolidation, concentration, threatens our market, threatens our economy, threatens our democracy. So this is what we're seeing on the political side. Now the Republicans and, and Donald Trump were not quiet on this either. I mean, he certainly ran a populist campaign. So in, earlier in the campaign, he says, it's not just the political system that's rigged, it's the whole economy. Okay, and he liked to use the word rigged quite a bit for both political issues and economic issues and speaking in a populist way about large companies. And then after the election, um, they were together there, the vice president and president-elect, and this Pence said, um, the free market's been sorting it out, America's been losing, and the president-elect at the time, now president, said, every time, every time. So that is not what you expect to hear from a Republican, right? <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so where is this going to go? Um, I should say, before I leave the political realm, the voice of a more traditional Republican perspective, the only one I've seen at, you know, in any high level of visibility, is uh, Commissioner O'Hilson, who's the Republican member of the Federal Trade Commission and has been for a number of years, uh, basically pointing out what you would expect, actually, a Republican to say which is not so fast. The fact that there's concentration in profits doesn't mean we've got a problem. Don't jump to conclusions. And antitrust should be a precision tool used very carefully and not uh, you know, a blunt instrument or a hammer. So she was uh, playing that traditional role of let's be cautious, but certainly not the president-elect, uh, the president himself. Okay. All right, so now I want to have the next, next uh, phase here. I just want to go through the empirical evidence a little more closely, but very quickly so I can comment on it. So the CEA, Council of Economic Advisors, uh, came out with this report in April. And um, while it was cautiously stated the way economists do, be careful and evidence, basically the message was we're concerned about increasing concentration in market power. And here's all sorts of measures of why we're concerned. And, and they basically looked at concentration, profits, and entry barriers or redu reduced ability to enter, or dynamism in the, in the economy, okay? And as they say here, competition may be decreasing in many economic sectors. Now, I served on the CEA, and actually the chair, the now just stepped down, Jason Furman, really good economist. So, you know, the CEA, they do sort of serious work, but, you know, in the White House, so it's got a uh, political side. And I know for a fact President Obama was, you know, actually involved with this and encouraging this whole project, uh, and that led to an executive order of his in, in, uh, that I'll mention too. So he was definitely behind this, but in a much more, I would say, you know, calibrated way than we might see from uh, some of the rhetoric that was in the campaign. Okay. So one of the things the CEA did was was report um, 
concentration in, in measures in a range of sectors. But uh, I'm sort of unhappy to have to say they looked at the fifth top, fifth, they looked at the 50 firm concentration ratio in very broad sectors. Okay, so and it's gone up over time, and they've reported that. But I don't think any antitrust economists think that tells us very much that the top 50 firms in retail trade, you know, have now 37% uh, of the market rather than 25%. You know, that's not the level we look at for antitrust analysis. So interesting, but not very convincing. Um, Actually, somewhat more convincing is some of the work The Economist reported. They've got a very nice website up there, you can go track it down here, where you can look at, uh, they hit, so the key thing is they, they broke the economy into 893 sectors, which are a lot closer to what we would call relevant markets, okay? Um, so, you know, but still too broad, okay? Pharmaceuticals, obviously too broad for a market. Uh, motor vehicles might be a good one, okay? Um, electric power distribution, not so clear because we've got a big country, so distribution in California is not competing with distribution in New England, but in supermarkets, kind of interesting. So, and they're basically showing there's been a, a generalized trend towards increasing concentration, and they use the four from concentration ratio. So I cut out, a, I, I, they allow you to slice at some of the different uh, sectors and see what it looks like. So I just, just want to display a few of these. So on the horizontal axis, I guess I should have said that before, and the horizontal axis is concentration in 1997, and then the vertical axis is concentration in 2012 or so, so 15-year period. So if things are above, uh, above the 45-degree level line, it means they become more concentrated. But if they're now near the origin, it means that the concentration ratio isn't all that high, even a four-firm four, concentration ratio may be 40%. If you think about how that translates to Herfindahl's, we, don't think, we think that's very, not very concentrated. Four firms have 40 or 50% of the market. Uh, so part of the disjoint here is the press and people are looking and seeing some increase in concentration, but they're not seeing increases to the level that we in antitrust, at least in the United States, would see as a big worry, okay? If the, you know, four firms go from 40 to 50 percent or 60 percent even, that's still not in what we, probably not in what we consider a highly concentrated range. So if you look at some sectors, retailing, uh, you know, a lot of it's not very concentrated. The one up, that big, the big circle up at the top, that's wholesale clubs and super centers, which is a $406 billion, and four firms have 93%. So then we could, so I'm saying, that's interesting. I asked myself, does it worry me that the four top firms in wholesale clubs and super centers have 93% of the market? And I find myself wanting to know, well, I'd like to know city by city, and do they compete with other types of format for selling things? So um, I kind of shrug my shoulders. I'm not sure what to make of it, actually. Concentration in manufacturing, there are a lot of manufacturing sectors they broke out. They're all over the place, probably not that concentrated generally. Information technology, you know, we have the, some of the same concentrated industries you do, wireless carriers uh, being an obvious one, where the four firm concentration ratio is now 89%, and that's up a lot. But that's an example of how one has to be careful, at least in the United States. A lot of the reason that's gone up is because regional firms have consolidated into national firms. So when you look at the national shares, they're, they're more concentrated, but in a regional area, it's not, it's not necessarily much more concentrated. And maybe four firms is okay. We wouldn't want to let them emerge to three, and they tried and it was stopped, but um, it's not clear that we're suffering from having only four rather than six. Uh, we don't know, but it's not like two or one at least. Okay. Some of these other areas, um, you know, data hosting is an interesting one that's growing a lot, and the concentration there is actually declining. Okay, all right, all right. Um, cross ownership, um, uh, I'll skim over this, but the, the issue here is BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Fidelity. In, uh, in this case, in the financial sector, they, they, the cross ownership is significant. We have it in airlines as well. And you can measure the Herfindahl Index, and you can correct the Herfindahl Index for cross ownership, and that's what Martin Schmalz and others have done. And there's a, there's a whole line of work going on now about if we account for this cross ownership, are some of our industries really more concentrated than we think, and we should be more concerned about it. It's very much up in the air as a matter of the research. I think it's really interesting, but um, unresolved. So moving from concentration to profits, uh, this is a nice work by Jason Furman and Peter Orzag, who used to be the head of the Office of Management and Budget at the beginning of the President uh, Obama's term. So here, you've got return to non-financial corporate capital. Uh, that's the red and the blue. And then the one-year real interest rate. So they're pointing out that the return to capital, outside the financial sector at least, 
has not changed that much, but real rates have gone down. So, the, so, so effectively, the return, the risk return to, to, to share ownership for these companies has gone up a lot, and this is an indication of higher profits. They also looked, I'd never seen this done before, I think it's rather clever, they looked at skewness. The top, the 90th, uh, if you look at the distribution of returns across firms, of course, some are gonna do really well, you know, just very successful, others less so. The top 10%, or the, the 90th percentile, which is to reflect the 10% the most profitable terms, firms in terms of the return, uh, are picking up a, a much higher share of the profits than it used to be the case. So just as we talk about more of the income and wealth goes to the top families or individuals, more of the profits are going to the most profitable firms. It's kind of interesting, uh, intriguing, doesn't, not, doesn't tell us anything. There's also evidence that corporate profits are persistent, uh, tend to persist more. A firm is highly profitable now, or over one year is more likely to be highly profitable 10 years later than used to be true uh, previously, okay? Um, so, and the top companies, a lot of them are tech companies, okay? So this is all sort of indications that something's not quite as healthy as we, we used to be in terms of our metrics of competition. This is one that, that um, I think is also relevant. The, what we're measuring here are startup and exit rates. So the, the, how many new firms are starting and how many firms are exiting. And the, uh, the, the orange bar is the startup rate. So this is the number of new firms divided by the total number of firms. Okay, so it's gone down from 12, 13% down to 8% over a period of 30 years or so. Okay, and that doesn't look encouraging. On the other hand, I sit in my office in Berkeley and I look out over Silicon Valley and I think they're doing pretty damn well. So what do you make of these data? Yeah, but these are things that people are pointing to. Uh, I think my last chart on the data before I get to interpretation, uh, this is a nice study by the OECD, so now it's not just the US, and they started in 2001 and looked at labor productivity and showed that the most productive, the, the frontier firms, as they call them, that are really, um, most productive and most successful are opening up a big gap with the laggard firms, as they call them, um, in both manufacturing and services. And yet the laggard firms are not going out of business and they're not improving their productivity, they're still falling behind. So we would expect in competitive markets, firms that are less productive would lose share and exit. And that's not happening very quickly, at least, across these OECD countries. Okay, so it makes you wonder about that. I don't know how Israel fits in on this one, actually. We could look it up. Um, all right, so what do we make of all this? So there's two interpretations at a high level. One is there's been a widespread decline in comp competition. Mergers, consolidation, barriers to entry are higher, and perhaps as well some exclusionary conduct by dominant firms, okay? And that this has contributed to productivity decline. One of our big issues, to be sure, is productivity growth is not what it used to be back in the 90s and some earlier decades in the US. And Donald Trump is promising much faster growth, but he hasn't told us how he's gonna achieve that. And productivity's gotta be at the base of it. So that's uh, part of the productivity puzzle, is it concentration? And then this also could be related to inequality. Um, the contrary interpretation, which I tend to go more with, okay, is that a lot of these markets are growing economies of scale. So we've had regional, uh, again, regional firms merging to form a national firms. We've had a lot of that in retailing, for example. Um, certainly the information technology sector is, has a lot of network, uh, network effects, other scale economies, uh, has been very innovative, and that we do see that in higher concentration and very high profits, okay. Um, and that, that, that's thrown off enormous benefits for consumers, actually. Um, a lot of these shares, as I said, are measured at the national level, and uh, retailing, for example, we have a very efficient retailing sector, and uh, the fact that it's somewhat more concentrated, I don't think is any worry, actually. Um, we have globalization, or at least we used to have it until uh, the current administration, now that President Trump has walked away from TPP, but we've had declining trade barriers, and uh, it's, it's clear consumers have been winners. Some workers have not, to be sure. Uh, but from a competition point of view, uh, that has uh, increased domestic competition, concentration, even in the United States, is of less concern when we have, when we have a lot of um, imports and exports, right? Um, so this contrary interpretation is there's not a broad, a widespread problem. There might be pockets of problems, 
Airlines could be an issue, and the DOJ has been concerned about that. Uh, pharmaceutical sectors, some of the, actually a lot of the healthcare sector is problematic for us. Hospitals, uh, insurance companies, the DOJ just successfully blocked a health, large health insurance, a $37 billion health insurance merger. It was just a decision yesterday by the court. Uh, pharmaceuticals, so, so th there, are some, there are some problem areas, and maybe areas where the government and uh, antitrust authority could have done more, but it's not a widespread, it's not widespread. This would be the contrary interpretation, which, again, I tend to be in that camp. Um, what are the implications? Um, there's clear implications for mergers, I think, which is um, some of the markets have become more concentrated. We need to be very careful to not let that continue, and it's definitely the case in the, la in the second term of the Obama administration, things tightened up a little bit. And of course, companies get the message very quickly. People figure out where the boundary is, what, what deals they can try, what deals they shouldn't even try. I work with a bunch of companies. Sometimes I tell companies, no, you shouldn't try. You know, you're, you're not, it's not going to get through, and they back off. So, so, um, so I think that, is, that the indication is that we should continue to have as tough or maybe even tougher merger control than we've had in the past. Uh, in part because of the evidence of some of the effects of, of mergers we've had, and also because there's weak evidence of, the, of, of merger synergies in some of these large mergers, okay? Um, how does that relate to where we're going, U.S.? Um, the DOJ and FTC have clearly become more skeptical about um, certain types of fixes. They've been rather frisky or aggressive even in mergers. Um, and Hillary Clinton was pointing that direction. Uh, but now we have Trump, of course, so what, is, what are we going to get? Uh, and I, you know, we can, maybe I'll turn to this at the very end. His rhetoric was very populist and therefore was in the direction of aggressive enforcement. He said he would stop the AT&T Time Warner merger as too, too much concentration in the hands of too few. Those are his words. He attacked Amazon, although probably because Jeff Bezos said, owns the Washington Post and the Post said things about him, but he did attack Amazon as having monopoly power. And this quote I said about free markets, so there, there's no, there's no uh, doc, love of free markets. On the other hand, the people that are, uh, he's putting in place, um, uh, the right-wing uh, cabinet, I'll call it, or any, any whether that's obviously a characterization, but uh, there's a lot of anti-regulation -regul rhetoric, and the signal so far is that the antitrust policy will be quite laissez-faire. Um, and that's really a tension with the populist rhetoric, to be sure. And then we've got the whole thing where he's focused on jobs and maybe willing to cut deals with companies to let deals to let mergers go through if they make promises about jobs. So that's um, kind of a, a very hard to predict, right? <laughs> like everything else about Trump at this point. Um, on exclusionary conduct, um, it's very hard for us. I think that to the extent you have concentrated markets that you're sort of frustrated by sometimes or feel that they're not serving the consumers, whether it's the food, food industry or others. Um, we when we have those markets, our antitrust uh, authorities, for better or worse, have really rather limited uh, ability to do much about it. Historically, there are very few monopolization cases brought, and that was true in the, in the Obama administration. I gave a speech over the first year and said, don't expect a lot of cases. We're going to look for them, but we probably won't have a lot. Uh, and that was proved true less than one a year, okay, in the whole, you know, DOJ and FTC, or maybe one a year if you put the two agencies together. Um, other ways to lower barriers to entry, not so much antitrust, are more promising, okay, trying to improve access to capital. Um, those that declining business startups, mostly that's just, that's more like companies like restaurants and not high growth startups, okay. The, the area we really want to encourage are the high growth startups, I would say. Nothing against restaurants, I like restaurants, but it's not critical to the economic growth. And the reason we in the U.S. have probably fewer restaurant startups is because we have a more mature industry with a lot of chains are in place. And, and we've, we have had fewer startups generally of small businesses since the Great Recession because people don't have access to capital from equity in their home, for example. Their wealth is down. Um, uh, I'll skip over intellectual property. That's a whole other lecture and speech. Um, and we'll see whether there will be some, um, some efforts to uh, reduce regulatory barriers to entry. Um, the uh, occupational licensing is a big one in, in America because it's really, there's been so much of it, and it makes it harder for people to, to enter professions. Um, 
So those are the things we can do. At the, uh, within the last year, President Obama did issue an executive order instructing all federal agencies to promote, uh, to take actions to help promote competition and work with the DOJ to do so. Um, so this is a real, a really a plus. Let me give one example of that and then I'll conclude. Uh, there was a regulation about snowmobiles in Yellowstone Park, right? It's a lot of snow there, people, it's a huge park. People go in and snowmobiles, but they're noisy and they pollute. So they had a regulation to have them be quieter and pollute less. There was only one company that was making the snowmobiles that could meet the regulations, the new regulations, okay? So part of the competition effort was to say, can we relax those for a while or, or move the regulations in over a period of a couple of years so that all the uh, outfitters there who are buying these machines won't have a, a single monopoly supplier, okay? And there are other examples like that. Um, let me close with the talking about uh, real and fake populism, okay? Um, so we are, we've heard a lot of populist rhetoric, and to the extent that really is gonna be followed up, so real populism, um, I have some concerns that they're expecting antitrust to do things that antitrust is not meant to do and cannot do. I don't think antitrust can solve inequality problems, certainly not in the United States. I don't know if anybody even thinks about it that way in Israel. I hope not. Um, Competition policy certainly should not be anti-business. I mean, it shouldn't necessarily be pro-business, it's pro-consumer, but it shouldn't be anti-business. And there's a danger of that when you get the populist rhetoric and people talking about uh, corporations as though they're you know, evil in some way. And then, then there's always there's gonna be a call for price controls. And I know this has been an issue for you here. I carefully had some cottage cheese my first morning here in, in, uh, in when I was in Jerusalem. Um, and let me just say, there's, if you want to regulate prices, get a sector-specific price regulator to do it. Okay, we have some, you know, we have like regulated electricity prices, okay? We regulate, you know, utilities, a few areas, but it is not what antitrust agencies do, and the DOJ and the FTC carefully stay away from that, of saying what's an excessive price. And, you know, and we've had a, a pretty mixed history in terms of re regulating prices and have generally gotten out of it in most markets over the past 40 years. Uh, so, that's a danger of real populism. We also have a danger right now, in the U.S. at least, of fake populism, um, which is the rhetoric of populism followed by what the Trump administration, I would say, is more likely to do, which is more of a permissive, uh, more of a laissez-faire approach. Uh, and and uh, as an antitrust person, I hate the idea of sacrificing consumers by letting deals go through that are anti-competitive if the companies promise some jobs in the mix or promise not to move their facilities abroad or something like that. I don't know how believable those promises are and in any event, antitrust enforcement is about protecting consumers and competition and shouldn't be a sacrifice uh, in that way, at least until our laws are changed and they're very clear that the laws are about consumers. So uh, those are some warnings here and I hope you will adhere to the rule of law and I hope our government will as well. Thank you. Thank you.